we are going to be looking at the topic, enemies of faith. The enemies of faith. Now, you may be wondering, well, how can faith has, have enemies? Come on, it's faith. Yes, it actually does. Enemies of faith. Every nation, every nation in the world have a legal means of transacting business, of managing their relationships, of exchanging services, of dealing one with another. That system is generally and usually universally accepted by all as the way to transact business, as the way to get things done, as the way to, to relate one to another, either in private or in public, either in business or in any other way. Everyone has a, a system that's been established that they use. For instance, the globally accepted mean, acceptable means of transacting any business is by buying and selling. It's by exchanging your time or your, your resources like money or other valuable things for what you need. It's by negotiating terms and, and conditions that will undergird the contract or the exchange that you're about to get into. And usually there is a means of measuring or determining the value of this exchange. In this current world that we live in, that measure is, is usually in, 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 a, in one form or one type of currency or another. If you live in the United Kingdom, for instance, you will be exchanging goods and services using pound sterling as a unit of measurement. If you live in America, you'll be using dollars. If you live in, in, the, in the European Union, you'll be using Euro. If you live, wherever you live, you will be determining the value. You will be exchanging services based on a standard. And that standard is usually a type of currency. In the kingdom of God, there's also a universally agreed means of transacting business, especially between man and God. There's a universal measure. There's a universal unit. There's a universally agreed means of measuring values, of exchanging, of transacting business between you and God. God doesn't spend dollars or sterling or euro or naira or yen or rubies. God does not spend any of that. That is for where you are right now. That is for where you domicile. That is for the country where you live in. But as far as the transaction between man and God is concerned, the universally agreed, the adopted system and means of measuring this exchange is faith. Faith is not an idea. Faith is not a movement. It's not even a theology. It's not a doctrine. Faith is not a sect. No, faith, however, is the language that heaven recognizes, is the language that heaven hears, is the language that heaven responds to, is the language that even heaven cannot ignore. Faith is the language of communication between man and God. I know some of you are saying, no, Tunde, that's not correct. It is prayer. It is your giving, it is your service, it is your fasting, it is your this, it is your that. Whatever you think it is, let me tell you today, even all of that, your sowing, your serving, your fasting, your prayer, your all of that will still be of no effect if they are not channeled through the means of faith. Faith is not an idea. It's not something somebody thought about. No, faith is, is the key. 
No wonder in four different passages of the Bible, without, it, it, there weren't suggestions. There weren't uh, ideas. They were not even, well, if you think about it, no. They were specific. God was specific four times in the Bible where he reminded you and I that this life that we have, this relationship that we have with him, the basis of this relationship for it to function, for it to benefit you, for it to add values to you, for you to connect to him, for you to receive from him. The basis of this relationship is faith. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11 from verse five to verse six, Hebrews 11, five to six, it says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was taken. They couldn't find his dead body or his living body. He, God just took him. But then there was a, a record, there was a, a, a report, there was a legacy, there was an, a, 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 something that was left behind as a testimony of his existence. He said before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Who measured that pleasing? How did we arrive at the conclusion that he pleased God? Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Enoch was taken. He just, he just vanished. I think he was the first person to, to experience rapture. He just gone. But there was a testimony that was left behind that he pleased God. And then we're told, in order for you and I to please God, in order for you and I to experience the same level of relationship, of connection that Enoch had with God, so that we can also carry the same testimony, there is only one root. And that is by faith, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. How do you demonstrate that? When you come to God, you must first believe that God is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. And you must also believe that if you, if you, uh, if you walk before him by faith, like Enoch, he will reward you abundantly for your diligence. No wonder he said to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. And I, I will prove to you that I am your exceeding great reward. The language, the language and the spirit that we, we find in this verse six, that is why it is important that your faith is not tied to anything. Your faith is not bound to something. Your faith is not anchored on anything. Because anything and everything that you can tie your faith to, that thing is produced by faith. No, don't tie your faith to that healing. Don't tie your faith to that prosperity. Don't tie your faith to that new job. Don't tie your faith to that marriage. Don't tie your faith your faith rather to that favor. No, 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 no. Those are products of faith. Faith produces all those things. Rather, it is important. It is very, very extremely important that your faith and my faith are anchored in God himself. Nothing, anything. Not in any, anything or anybody, but God himself. 
Because when you put your faith in him, when your faith is anchored in God, then you'll be in a place where you can trust his word. You'll be in a place where you can believe his promises. You'll be in a place where you can boldly step out based on his covenant. Why? Because you trust him. You know he's faithful. You know he cannot lie. You know he will not fail you. You know he will not abandon you. But if your faith is tied to Tunde Disu or to Apostle Milo Moro or GODs or that building or that license or that qualification, don't be surprised when they disappoint you. If you doubt who God is, if you have a doubt, if I have a doubt about who God is, every other thing in your life and in my life will not work. In fact, they will just, they will be at a standstill and at a point they'll start to decay. Faith in its true sense, like I said, it's not an idea, it's not a movement, it's not a sect, it's not a theology, it's not a concept, it's not anything. Faith in its fullness is God himself. Oh, God. Faith in the fullness of its manifestation is God himself. Look in Mark chapter 11. Mark 11 from verse 21 to verse 24. The gospel of Mark chapter 11 from verse 21 to verse 24. And Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. He didn't even say have faith in me. No, he said have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatsoever thing. Whatsoever thing you pray for, whatsoever thing you want from God, whatsoever miracle and breakthroughs and healings and wholeness, whatsoever thing you want from God, when you pray, believe. Don't just believe that you will be healed. That's a byproduct. Don't just believe that your bills will be paid. That's a byproduct. Don't just believe that you will be, you will be employed by that Fortune 500 company. That's a byproduct. No, believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can think or ask him so that when you ask, you are asking in faith without a doubt in your heart. Faith is the currency of heaven. It is the legal tender. You can't go to, I know the whole world is polluted now. That's why people will go to Nigeria instead of spending Naira, they'll be spending dollars. They will go to, to China instead of spending the uh, Chinese yen, they will be saying, do you, do you accept Euro? But as far as heaven is concerned, there's only one tender, one, only one legal tender, and it is faith. The, trans the transaction between God and man is only signed off on the basis, on the, on, the, on, the, on the altar of faith. And that's why God said, guys, I need you to hear this. I need you to know this. Don't ever forget this. Keep this somewhere you can never forget it. But just in case, Life started bothering you and bashing you and knocking you, and you have the tendency to forget. I will remind you four times. What is it? He, will, he, he reminded us four times in the word about the importance of faith in your life and in my life. First in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. 
Galatians 3, 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. The just. That's you and I. We shall, we must, we have to. The only way for us to live is by faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, he reminded us again. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If anyone draws back, if anyone pulls away from living by faith, God said, my soul will have no pleasure in that person. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, he said, behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, written the just shall live by faith. What, wh why, why do we need to be reminded over and over and over and over again that we, the righteousness of God in Christ, the prescribed way for us to live is by faith? Why does God need to keep reminding us of that? And that is what we're going to be looking at today. Because whether you know it or not, whether you agree to it or not, whether you believe it or not, there's an enemy losing town. He's looking for who he would devour. My prayer today is that you will be cocooned. In fact, you're already cocooned. You're already protected. He said a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 on your right hand. He will not come near you. Just live by faith. If the prescribed way for you and I, as those who are the righteousness of God, if our prescription is that we must live by faith, if faith is so important to God for each and every one of us to garrison everything about our lives by faith, I think it is common sense then to, to, to assume, not even to assume, it is, it, is, it is logical for us to conclude that the enemy of God, which is the devil himself, would definitely come after those who are dead to God's heart. And how will he do that? He will start to obstruct. He will start to derail. He will start to destroy the relationship that you and I have with God. How will he do that? He will just go attack the one thing through which we please God, which is faith. No wonder. No wonder Jesus drew a differentiation, a, 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 a line between his purpose, and that of the devil. So that you don't get confused. Jesus wanted us to know that there's an enemy losing time. And that enemy is, is, is bent. It's, it has made up his mind. Whatever happened, this faith thing must be destroyed. And so Jesus wanted us to know in John chapter 10 from verse 9 to verse 10, John, 9, John 10, verse 9 to 10. He said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. The enemy has a purpose. Jesus has a purpose. The purpose of the enemy is to steal your faith, is to kill your faith, is to destroy your faith. But Jesus said, don't worry, I'm here. And my purpose is that you will have life, a life filled with faith and garrison by faith, so much so that you will have it so much in abundance on it, and it will be so filled up and it will start to overflow. I have come that you may have life and that your life may please God because it is based on the faith in God. 
Now, the devil may not physically approach you with two horns and long tail. He may not expose himself to you physically. Because that will scare you. You're like, ooh, what's that? No, he has other means, other tricks, other ways, other avenues, other plans through, through which he will attack, he will, he, will, he will condemn, he will accuse, he will judge you, he will speak ugly of you, he will make you think less of yourself, he will question your relationship with God. Everything the devil is doing is to, to accomplish three things, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that focus is on your faith. The key is not just about you knowing that the enemy is, is after you. The key is not just you knowing some of the ways by which you will attack your faith. The key is for you to understand that the purpose of the enemy is to eat away at the ebbs of your faith so that you will not please God. And when you cannot please God, you cannot receive anything from him. And when you cannot receive anything from him, your life is forward living. And that life you have will not be in full, will not be overflowing, will not be in abundance, which is the purpose of Jesus. And then you start to question, what's the point of this Christianity? What's, don't tell me about Jesus. Look at my life. No, it's not about looking at your life. It's about you going back to the root and understand that the enemy is after your faith. So what do you do about that? Now that you know the enemy is in town, now that you know the enemy is after your faith, now that you know that the enemy is focused on destroying the relationship that you have with God by attacking your faith, what do you do? I have an answer for you. In the book of James chapter four, verse seven, James chapter four, verse seven, it says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God. Resist the devil and you will see him take off like, like, like a fighter jet. You can only resist and defeat the enemy by fulfilling the first part of the scripture, by submitting yourself to God, by giving your life to God, by accepting the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid for with his life, by you becoming born again, by you being known and being declared as a child of God like we sang this morning. Submit to God. Take on the principles of God. Align your thoughts and your ways with the dictates and the instructions and the commandments of God. And the enemy will have nothing on you. They came to Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane and they wanted to arrest him. They said, we're looking for Jesus. He said, here I am. And they, they, as soon as they wanted to touch him, they all fell down and fell back. Because the enemy has nothing on him. Don't let the enemy have just have a credit against you that he can withdraw from time to time and use against you and use to stop you and use to derail you and use to attack your faith. No, just submit to God. The rest will be, will you, you walk on water and nothing will touch you. Let's quickly look at some of the enemies of faith that are apparent that are operating, that are relevant, that we must pay attention to so that we can see them from afar and know what to do with them and about them. The first enemy of faith that I want us to look at this morning is ignorance. Ignorance of your righteousness and your identity in Christ. If you are ignorant of who you are, of whose you are, of where you are and where you're going, if you don't know yourself, you have left yourself open for others to identify you, to describe you, to call you names, to, to use whatever adjective they, they, they know or, or have to describe you. Ignorance is just, it's not just expensive. You've heard that ignorance is no bliss. 
the enemy will and can take away from you only that which you don't know you have. This is my pen. As you can see, the ink is almost running out. Why? Because I've been using it for a while. I know this is my pen. But what if I don't know it is my pen? If there are other 10 pens there and they all got mixed up, anybody can come and say, oh, that's my pen. They will take it and walk away. Why? I don't know that it's my pen. It is that which you don't know that the enemy will take away from you. Read your, the Bible. In the passage of the, of the sower, Jesus said, those the, the ones who receive the good news, but because they don't know what they have, it has no root in them. Before you know it, challenges of life comes, it's gone. You and I, we have an inheritance because of the righteousness that has been credited to us by God through the sacrifice of Jesus. We have an inheritance in God and that inheritance is rooted in our righteous standing with God. And that righteous standing, oh dear, that righteous standing has nothing to do with what you've done, what you have not done, what you said, where you were last night. No, no, no. It's all about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has paid for and given to you as a free gift. And if you don't know it, if you don't know it, you can't, you can't understand it. And if you don't understand it, you can't value it. If you can't value it, you can't protect it. And if you can't protect it, the enemy will come and take it away from you. Inheritances are only distributed among children, among heirs, among family members. No stranger is qualified to receive of the inheritance. No slaves is even, I don't care how long that slave has been in that house, they are not entitled to partake of inheritance. But you and I, we are his children. We are children of God and we have an inheritance in him. But in order for us to partake of that inheritance, we must protect what we know. We must protect our identity. We must understand that we didn't work for this. We didn't pay for it. We don't even have what it takes to get it. It's a free gift. And therefore, hold on to it. Know who you are. Know whose you are. Understand your righteousness in God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 said, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We were dead in sin. I mean, dead, dead. D-E-A-D. -E Raised to power minus over 100 multiplied by billions. We were dead. And then he came, took the dead took death away from us and gave us life, gave us his righteousness. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that you and I, we can lay hold of this thing called the righteousness of God. In Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15 from verse five to verse seven, talking about the relationship between Abraham and God. That's why Abraham is called the, the father of faith. The righteousness before Jesus Christ sacrificed, Abraham was the first person that righteousness was accredited to. Why? Because of faith. Genesis 15, 5 to 7. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to number them, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Because of Abraham's believing in God, God, because of his faith in God, God accredited to him 
righteousness. And because of that accreditation, because of that deposit, because of that endowment of righteousness, immediately he became an, a, a, an heir of, to the inheritance of God. God did a show and tell for Abraham. You see, this is what it is. And because he believed God, which is a demonstration of his faith, God, God credited him with righteousness. What do you believe this morning? What do you believe? How are you exercising your faith regarding the promises of God, regarding the covenant of God, regarding the completed work of Christ on the cross for you and I? What, 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 what is that thing that is making you question or doubt both God and his word? It is not enough to believe. No. Look at what Abraham did. Abraham demonstrated the truth of his belief by acting on God's instruction to prove his faith. And when God saw that, God said, yes, now I know. Now I know. From now on, you're my friend. From now on, you, you have my righteousness. Ignorance is an enemy of your faith. Make it a point of duty, therefore, to revisit the content and the context of your inheritance as a child of God, as the, as the righteousness of God, so that you can easily identify when they, where and when there's a potential hope or ignorance or something lurking in the corner that the enemy can lash onto and rob you of your inheritance. Number two, enemy of faith, hopelessness. Hopelessness. Last week, we were looking at the topic, faith without hope is dead. Hopelessness is another enemy of faith. What do I mean by that? Look, at, look with me in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 from verse 1 to verse 3. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are invisible. By faith, we know that these things that we're seeing, all these things around you and around me, they were made out of something that we cannot see. You know, this world system, every system of the world tries on, on, on spreading fear, spreading hopelessness spreading alternative realities, telling you don't believe your eyes, just believe what I'm telling you. Don't believe your, 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 your truth, just believe the truth that I give you as a truth. The implication of that is everybody, well, not everybody, most people are living a life without hope because they are gripped by this, 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 this cancer called hopelessness. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many degree you have. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you are not in the cabal, if you are not in the clique, if you are not part of the group, then you can't make it in life. Then you, people say, well, what's the point of trying? There's no chance, so why try? Hopelessness. Hopelessness, it dilutes your hope for tomorrow. It, it negates against your expectation based on the word of God. Yes, this life is full with challenges. 
This life is filled rather with challenges. But what did Jesus say? He said, in this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> I like the way Jesus talks sometimes. He just lays it straight on you. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have problems. You will have persecution. You will have challenges. People will align you, align you and call you names and curse you out. And he said, in this world, you have troubles. But don't worry about that. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But if all your focus is on those trouble, you won't see the overcoming power of God at work in your life. And that, my brother, my sister, is hopelessness. When all you can see is the trouble, when all you can see is that the road is blocked, when all you can see is there is no chance you can escape, no way out, you can't survive this. This is going to kill you. This, they're going to repossess your house. Now they come and take your car. Now your children are... If that is all you can see, you have no hope. And without hope, faith cannot work. Hopelessness is the root of depression. It's the reason people come to a point where they think this life is not worth living. Might as well commit suicide. Even some sicknesses, some diseases, some ailments, some pains and, and that is so rampant in the world today, most of them, some of them, when you dig deep, you'll find that the bottom line is hopelessness. But I've got good news. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It does not matter what the challenge is. It does not matter what you are facing. The last thing that must die in you is your hope. The last thing that the enemy should be able to say, I've tried everything, this is your hope. Because if you have hope, if you still have an iota, an element, a tiny, winny bitty of hope, then your faith has a chance to bring to pass that which you expect. The last thing that should die in you and with you and from you is your hope. Remember the story of Abraham. Against hope, he believed in hope and was rewarded with the promised son Isaac. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 1 says, but for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. If you do, and you feel a warm steam come out, it means you are still alive. Then there is hope for you. Don't let it go. Don't give up on yourself. The book of Job chapter 4. Job chapter 4 from verse 7 to verse 9. For there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, that it will sprout again. That, and that its tender shoots will not cease though its root may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the center of water, it will burn and bring forth branches like a plant. What is that thing? What are those things? How many are they that are just, just you just think, if, uh, I give up. No job, homeless, there are family trouble, sickness and disease, debt collectors such as they live are coming. Your children are wayward. Your mother-in-law is this. Your uncle is that. And it's like, who did I offend? Why, why, why did who gave birth to me? If that is where you are, listen to what Job said. For there is hope for a tree, even when that tree has been cut down, that that tree will rise up again. And that its tender shoot will not cease. Even when its root has already grown old and decayed in the ground, even when the, 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 the branch, the, the trunk of the tree is, 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 is been eaten up by, by worms and, and everything else, just the smell 
Just the scent of water is all it needs. And for as long as there is hope, you are not finished. You are not over. It's not over for you as long as you have hope. As long as you have hope, then the enemy cannot steal your faith. If the enemy can steal your hope, cut short your expectations, stop you from imagining your bright future, it has rendered your faith redundant, absolute zero. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Say no to hopelessness. Say no to hopelessness. Give your faith a fighting chance by laying hold and refuse to let go of your hope. Because to the living, there is hope. And a dead, a living dog is better than a dead lion. The third enemy of faith, as we begin to round off, the third enemy of faith is fear. Fear. You know, many destinies, many purposes in life, many goals and aspirations in life, they have been aborted, they have been unattempted, they have been derailed, they have been stolen, or they just been cast away just before they get to the finishing line because of fear. What are you afraid of? No, I'm not afraid of that, you liar. You are afraid of something. You are afraid of someone. You are afraid of somehow. There is something that you are afraid of. And for as long as that thing is in your life, it will render your faith jobless. It will render your faith lifeless. It will render your face useless. And remember, without faith, it is impossible to receive anything from God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Fear. Fear is an enemy of faith. And the greatest fear in life is the fear of man. No wonder Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man is a prison. Yeah, it's a, it's a cell in the prison where it's, a, it's an isolation cell in the prison. When it gets you in there, it locks the door, shut the window, and you are alone in the dark. The fear of man. What will they say? How will they respond? What if they don't believe me? Who will support me? Where am I going to get help from? What if it doesn't work? What if and then? What if and then? What if and then? We've just celebrated two years of running this, 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 this ministry now. Who could have said, I was so afraid. After two months, what will I be preaching? What will I be saying? What if nobody even hears it? What if, and what if, and what if, and what if, and what? Fear. And then you have people in your life who are telling you, you can't make it. You're not cut out for this. You're not made for this. You don't have what it takes. You are rubbish. You are stupid. You are this. You are that. You. And that fear just keep mounting and mounting and growing. Before you know it, it grew so big that I can't even see beyond it to the calling. What are you afraid of today? What is that one thing? What are those things? Who is that, who is that person in your life that you are so afraid of that you would rather align with them and disobey God? Fear is a faith killer. Most of the things in life are achievable. 
Most of the things in life are not beyond human accomplishments. Most of the things in life are just waiting for you to reach out and touch it, waiting for you to declare it and see it, waiting for you to attempt it and see it come to pass. Unfortunately, many are still not blessing the world with that destiny that they carry because they are afraid. They are afraid. They are afraid. Listen, get home this afternoon or whenever. Do a, a, a sincere audit of your life, of yourself, and ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, what if it works? You can't make an omelet without breaking an egg. No wonder, uh, late uh, uh, Miles Moreau said the graveyard is the, is the wealthiest place on earth because it is filled with lives, lives not lived. It is filled with progress is not made. It is filled with breakthroughs not attempted. It is filled with books not written, songs not sung. It is filled with efforts not made to see the power of God at work because of fear. What is that fear that is holding you back today? Who is that person that you are so afraid of, you would rather disobey God just so that they don't get angry with you? In what area of your life and my life has fear crippled you from living the life that Jesus paid for with his life for you to enjoy? Somebody said fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is only a shadow. And the last time I checked, the shadow never bites anybody. Get out of from under that cloud of fear today in the name of Jesus. Step out into the cold. Yes, it's cold, but step out. Yes, it's hot, but step out. Yes, it's difficult, but step out. Yes, it's impossible to you, but step out because with God, nothing is impossible. Take that first step. Make that first move. Say that first word. Write that first line. Do that first thing. And see God at work in your life. When fear knocks at your door, you send faith to open it. You will see fear take off like it, it never. It, it, no. Fear is an enemy of faith. Number four, as we begin to close. Closed mouth. There is more to faith than just believing. You must act on what you believe, but that action must be preceded by the words of your mouth. A closed mouth, they say, is a closed destiny. Most of the things in life, you have not touched them, you have not tasted them, you have not experienced them, because all you do is you're just thinking about them and just thinking about them until you give it life by the word in your mouth. They will continue to just be there giving you migraine in your head. Jesus said, this mountain will not move until you say to it until you command the mountain to move, it will be there in your life. God couldn't make any difference to this world without form or shape until he opened his mouth and said, like be, and everything started to change. What in, in life, listen to this, in life, you will either have what you tolerate by keeping your mouth quiet, and be giving whatever, whoever, whatever they, they decide to apportion to you. Or you will get what you negotiate. And that negotiation is with your mouth. Romans chapter 10 from verse 8 to verse 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You couldn't even get born again without saying it. 
you can believe it all you have in all you, all you want in your heart. It won't still happen until you open your mouth. No wonder the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore speak. What are you saying? Or are you just keeping your mouth shut? You know, David didn't kill Goliath with the stone and the sling. No. David killed Goliath with the word of his mouth. He said, today, I'm going to serve your body to the wild beast of this field. Goliath was dead at that point. The stone was just to announce to the whole world that don't worry about his height. He's already dead. The woman with the issue of blood, she said to herself in her house, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, the rest is story. And it happened to her. Jesus came to that fig tree, hoping to say something to it, and he saw nothing. He, he opened his mouth and said, you're a dead tree. He died from the root up. The sea was raging and was the, the disciples were screaming and shouting. Jesus came up and said, please be still. I need to sleep. And the thing just, why is your mouth closed? Why is your mouth closed today? Because your closed mouth is negating the power of faith in your life. Can I say something? Now, some of you may not agree to this, and I respect that, but let me tell you what I believe. In my opinion, one of the greatest teachers of faith in the body of Christ today is Pastor Jerry Eze. In my opinion, one of the greatest teachers of faith in the body of Christ today is Jerry Eze. NSPPDC or whatever the name is. What do I mean? He's, he, he, he has tapped into the sleeping giant in the body of Christ. The ability to use your mouth to confess the word of God and release your faith in those words to see the difference in your life and in your circumstance. He's Training, he's, he's raising, God is raising an army through him and his ministry to wake up and take off our rightful place as the children of God and say it with our mouth because we believe it in our heart and nothing will be refused of us. He doesn't lay hands on anybody. He doesn't sell handkerchief. He doesn't sell anointing oil. He doesn't do all the all the karaoke's that we are all used to. No, he just say, wake up and pray. Open your mouth and say, open your mouth and say, open your mouth and say, and then he will say, what God cannot do does not exist. I mean, you've already put God's back against the wall. Guess what he will do? He will come out fighting like a, like a raging bull. Now, like I said, you may not agree. Oh, they shout a lot. Well, stay quiet then. Look at miracles. Look at healings. Look at ordinary people like you and I who are now saying to the dead, if you don't get up, I'll slap you off. Get up, and the dead are getting back to life. We never saw anything like that in the body of, at least to my knowledge. Why? Faith arose. He, he woke up something within the body of Christ to wake up and lay hold of faith and run with faith and believe in faith and believe the faith in God. And because faith has been applied, God is pleased and therefore God cannot resist doing what only him can do. Faith is a powerful force that can attain any result. But equally, there are oppositions. There are enemies whose purpose is to derail your faith, is to abort your faith, is to cripple your faith. But when you know them, you too 
you can begin to devise the strategies to nullify the effect of the enemy, to defeat the enemy even before they touch you because the only prescribed way for you and I to live this righteous life is by faith. And when you live by faith, God is pleased with you. And when God is pleased with you, he, nothing can be denied you of your inheritance. Amen and amen. Maybe you are in this service today or you're watching by enemies at some point, but you don't know what this right, this gift of righteousness, you don't know what it means. Let me help you. Jesus Christ, the son of God, the begotten son of God, he looked at you, he looked at me, he saw the sin that is drowning us and taking us to hell. And he paid the sacrifice. He paid the penalty. He took your sin upon himself and gave you his righteousness that you and I might live with God in heaven. And all he's saying is, would you accept this free gift? Would you accept that this is fully paid for? So if that is you right now, and you don't have this free gift in your life, you have never asked him to come into your heart and be your Lord and your Savior. Let today be the day that you change all of that. All I'm asking is for you to repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you this afternoon. I recognize that I'm a sinner. But more than that, I recognize that you've already paid for my sin. And right now, I confess them and I ask for your forgiveness. Wash me clean. Give me a brand new start. Come into my life right now. Be my Lord and my Savior. And I promise you, I will follow you and serve you and obey you all the days of my life. Thank you. Because now I know I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And my eternity is secured. In Jesus' name, amen.